You are the words and the music. You are the song that I sing. You are the melody. You are the harmony. Praise to your name I will bring. You are the Lord of lords. You are the mighty God. You are the King of all kings. So now I give back to you the song that you gave to me. You are the song that I sing. Love that song. That is one of my favorites. Uh, well, you got your Bibles with you. You're supposed to. It's Sunday, don't you? Sunday, you got uh, your Bibles with you. Oh, we have us a new baby in the church. Oh, the boat ride baby is here. It's good. So let's make sure we welcome them, but don't touch and love all over the baby. We don't want Riley to get sick. So uh, make sure you let them know you're glad to see him. It's been a while since they've been able to be here. But we are glad that they are here with us. There are several that are here today. Uh, We have a good number. It's a beautiful day outside. And we are here to worship. And as we look, you got your Bibles? Let's look at Mark. Uh, I said Mark chapter 4. That's the text that uh, was read. But we're going to go back just a little bit. I want you to, to look at a few things. To set the stage for the lesson today. To give us an idea about what's happening Jesus has just healed in chapter 3 the man with the withered hand. He has a withered hand and Jesus tells him to stretch it out and he makes it whole again. Well, the Pharisees, they're watching very carefully because they want to see if Jesus is going to do this on the Sabbath. They're watching very closely to catch Jesus. This is very early on in his ministry, church. Very early on and they're trying to catch him to do something with him because they're not liking all of the hoopla, they're not liking all of the popularity, all of the attention that Jesus is getting. In fact, there's a ton of people that are following him. A whole lot of people are hearing some of the things that he's doing. A whole lot of people are watching some of these miracles. And if you look there with me, look in chapter 3 and and notice this. Verse 7, Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea. A great crowd followed him from Galilee to Judea and Jerusalem to Amedia and beyond the Jordan and from around Tyre and Sidon. And the great crowd heard all that he was doing and they came to him. And he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they crush him. For he had healed so many so that all who had had diseases pressed around to touch him. And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and they cried out, You are the Son of God. And he strictly ordered them not to make him known. That's a little weird, isn't it? You notice that? You know, these Jesus has so much power, all these evil spirits are coming down in front of him and they're bowing down to him and they're calling him Lord. And he's telling them, you make sure you don't make that known just yet. So he tells the crowd, because there's so many of them, he tells those guys, he said, listen, you guys get me a boat ready. Have a boat, maybe something along the lines of this. I don't know if you can see that that well, but uh, it's a boat there on the shore. uh, Have a boat ready because they're pressing. The people are coming to me. They're pressing along. They they want me to touch them. They want to be healed. All these people are hearing all of these things. And it is just, it's very chaotic there for a little while that all of these disciples are there. Now I want you to put yourself there. I want you to put yourself there. I don't know how we would relate to that unless maybe we had, uh, Lee and I went to a concert this past week. We don't do that very often. We saw a lot of strange people. <laughs> we saw a lot of strange people. And there was a lot of people that were trying to get as close to they could, as they could to the stage to try to see the act that we're playing. Closest as, they, as close as they could and they were pushing and fighting. Maybe that's how you would see it as, as people are trying to get up there to see the celebrity Jesus. Maybe it's one of those Black Friday things, ladies. Maybe that's for you. Maybe it's one of those things where you're trying to get in Target and the doors are locked and they're waiting to open them up and they're being, you're being pushed, and everybody's, and you just can't wait to get in there, and you know, you feel that pushing and, and pulling of everybody leaning on you and trying to get you to go in a certain direction. And that's the crowd, and you're there. You've been watching Jesus. I mean, you're a good Jew. 
You're a God-fearing Jew. You're trying to obey the law. You're trying to keep all the commandments as best you can. And now Jesus is claiming to be the Son of God. And you want to know more about this. You've seen Him. You've heard Him do about, about these things. And you're intrigued and you want to know more. And you follow Him. You're on the shore there. He's standing out. We're going to read in just a few minutes that He goes and He stands in the boat. And He teaches from the boat. No telling how many people are there. And you, you, you're just privileged. You feel just privileged to be there. And, and as you're privileged to be there, you're listening to Him teach. And maybe you're sitting down and you're, you're just enthralled in what He's got to say. And you're thinking, oh, this is awesome. This is great just to be able to be in the presence of this man is wise. This man is sharing all of these great messages for us. And then He calls you by name. Wouldn't that be cool? Matthew! Matt, come up here. Come with me. I want you to do something with me. I want you to stay close to me. I want you to be those that are a part of my inner sanctum. I want you to be one of those guys that stays with me all the time. Thomas, over here. Peter. You see, we read the word disciple twice in the text that we've read in early in chapter 3. The disciples are pressing. He tells the disciples, that just means pupil. Means te- it means a student of a teacher. Somebody that is listening. But when you get on into the text here in verse 12, when he went up to the mountain, he's appointing the twelve. And he calls these twelve individually to be with him. Now I want you to try to feel just how important that is because you're sitting there very close to him. Maybe maybe he's in the boat and you're the twelve that are right around in a semicircle just listening to him. And you're thinking, oh, he called my name. This is great. I get to hear something special from him. And then he talks about a parable. Sower. And he tells this parable of seed being cast aside. And, and you're trying to think, where is he going with this? I don't know that I'm understanding. And you're trying to listen. Everybody's quiet. He begins to talk of other things about a mustard seed. And having faith the size of a mustard seed. All in chapter 3. And he's, he's going in detail about all of these things. And you're getting to hear it. I want you to be there. I want you to experience, because a lot of us, we're here, our goal is to take the next step this month. And we're here, we're followers of Jesus, we're here, that's why we're here. But these 12 disciples, they took that next step. Now it took Jesus to specifically call them by name and say, Hey you, come here, I want you to work with me, I want you to stay with me. It took him to really individually go to them and pull them to him. But there were some things that they had to do. I'm not going to do that today. I'm not going to just call you out of the crowd and say you need to be doing this and you need to be doing more of that. Or maybe you need to be trying to experience this a little different. Maybe you need to be stepping out of the boat a little bit and trying to do some different things. But that's primarily what Jesus is doing. And you're hearing him talk about all of these parables then You don't understand everything, but listen to this. This is really cool. When you look at chapter 4, verse 34, he's talking about the sower, the mustard seed, hiding your lamp under the the peck measure, you know, and, and, and letting your light shine. And then you get to verse 34, 33, 34. But with many such parables, he spoke the word to them, and they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable but privately to his own disciples. He explained everything. So not only are you getting to hear him, not only are you getting to experience this as one of the first guys on the row listening to Jesus, he's coming to you and he's sitting you down and he's saying, now, now did you explain, did you understand what I was trying to explain to you about this sower? No, Jesus, I did not. Well, let me explain this to you. Let me put it this way to you. And he individually meets with them. And talks to them and explains all things to them. And they get to listen. You followed this. And now Jesus is there. And he gets into the boat. And that's where we get to the next verse. On that day. 
when evening had came, when the sun went down, it's getting dark, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. Leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was. And the other boats were with him. There was a great windstorm that arose. The waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. They woke him and said, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. This is not really a lesson on the the storms of life. Although that has a play in it. This is just primarily of the lesson that we want to go about crossing over to the other side. Now when I put that up there on the screen, I thought somebody's going to think that's going from life to death or the afterlife. No, that's, that's the way we might use the term today, crossing over. No, I want you to just think of what it's going to mean, what it means for you. If you're going to take the next step, and it seems like I'm always going this way, right? This is the way we want to go, right? So if I'm over here and we want to take this next step Jesus is over there and he says come with me I want you to cross over to the other side of the sea with me now that's the challenge that's a little challenging because you know what if you look what's on the other side of the sea other versions and other texts are going to call what's on the other side of the sea a wilderness it's really a barren area that's on the other side of the sea. There's not a lot of population out there. It's very sparsely populated. There's not a whole lot of stuff going on over there. And, and you're one of these disciples that he's called. And he says, now come on with me. You've, you've come this far with me. Now take this next step and cross on over to the other side of the sea with me. And the disciples, I don't know that they were reluctant. I don't know that they were skeptical. But I think they would have been if they were just like us. You see, one of the blessings we have with Jesus is we, know, we, have the, we have the hindsight. We know everything about Jesus that we need to know. They did not yet. This is all new to them. We can look and say, well, I know in, in, in Romans it says this, in Galatians it says this about Jesus, and Colossians talks about his preeminence. So I know if he's telling me to do something, he is the top dog, he is the guy, he is the one that is wanting us to go, and, and he knows these, he knows all things. So I'm going to listen to him. They didn't have that luxury because those books had not been written. They're stepping out on faith. So there's three things that they got to do, church. Three things within this text. It's always three things, isn't it? <laughs> it's three things that they're going to do that Jesus invites them to do to cross over to the other side of the sea. Chapter 4, verse 36. On that day, 35, on that day when evening had come, he said to them, let us cross over. Go across to the other side. And the first thing they got to do is leaving the crowd. Oh, isn't that good? And leaving the crowd. If you want to go the extra mile, if you want to go the next step, that is really the way it looks, guys. That is it. You've got to leave the crowd behind you. Because the majority part of people are not going to live the life that Christ wants them to live. They're not going to want to take that next step. But if you are one of those that's willing to go, that's willing to cross over into an area that is unknown, they did not know what was going on on that other side of the sea. They did not know why Jesus wanted to go over there. They did not know where he wanted to go over there. They did not know the purpose of going over there. All they know is that Jesus, the man who healed this man with a withered hand, the man who's speaking to them in these parables, the man who's making a whole lot of sense and has this charisma and has this this theology that we are looking at and listening to and understanding who's an unlearned carpenter's son this guy is special and he's calling me to go that's all they knew but if they wanted to go they had to leave the crowd behind now let me ask you let me ask you to think for just a moment about maybe what's in that crowd men men this is what it takes you're one of these 12 that he called 
And he wants you to cross over to the other side. But you know what you got over here in the crowd? You got your wife and children over here, don't you? Now it's going to mean that he's asking you to leave them for a little while because he's wanting to train you to do something that's going to be magnificent. Something that's going to have a play in the salvation of the world. Are you going to get to go back? Maybe it's your family over here. Maybe it's a job. Maybe, maybe it's not just a job. Maybe it's your home, okay? And he's asking you to go across to this. You know what you might not have? You might not have clothes to go. You might not have luggage to go. You might not, how long are we going to stay? You don't see questions like, where are we going? How long are we going to stay? Do I need to pack a lunch? Do I need to bring money for lunch? Do I need an overnight bag? Am I going to need to bring... You know, my razor in case we, we stay a little longer or some deodorant and things of that nature. None of that. It's just, come on, let's go. They had to leave some things behind. The phrase, leave behind, is the same phrase that I would use today if I was there, if I had to take my jacket off. I'm going to take my jacket off and I'm going to lay it aside and I'm going to leave it. But maybe it's not people. Maybe it's not just people. Maybe it's things. Look in, look in these verses with me. Look at Romans chapter 13. Look at Romans 13 verses 12 and 13. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime. Not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality or sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to satisfy its desires. Let's, let's lay aside these deeds that are of the flesh and let's put Christ on. Let's take this off. Let's leave this, leave all of these things behind and move in the opposite direction of what these things are. Look at another one. Look at Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians chapter 4, we see something very similar. Chapter 4, verses 22 and 23. Put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life, and is corrupt through deceitful desires, to be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and put on the new self, created in the likeness of God, in the true righteousness of holiness and salvation then one more i've got several i think i put there on the your outline but look at chapter 12 verses 1 and 2 therefore since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses let us lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely to us or that so easily besets us and run the race with patience what he, he's saying here that when he tells these disciples why don't you come on over and cross to the other side with me and take that next step that you need to take. And leaving the crowd, you go. Maybe not just the crowd. Maybe family. Maybe there's some evil companions that corrupt your good morals that you need to leave behind to move to the other side. Maybe it's some habits. Maybe it's some sins. Maybe it's some temptations. Whatever the case, guys, you can't take a lot of stuff on this boat that's going to cross over to the other side. It's not a big boat. There's not a whole lot of time. You don't have time to weigh what you're going to bring and what you're not. What you've got to do is just go. So many times when we're trying to make this next step, we think too much. We think too much. I, I tell kids all the time that we can, we, sometimes we can be too smart for our own britches. We can think ourselves out of God. Because we want proof. We want evidence. And it's just, we may not have it. That's why it's faith. When Jesus asks Peter later on to step out of the boat, when he bids him to come and Peter steps out, Peter doesn't think, well, I weigh probably 210 pounds, and typically when something comes in contact with water, it's saying, I don't know if the science of this is going to work out. I don't know if this is going to be accurate. I don't really think that I'm going to be able to walk. There's got to be a plank he's walking on. How is he able to do this? What do you think about it, this, Thomas? Should I go over there? And Thomas is the doubter. And oh, I don't think you should, Peter. Judas, what do you think? Yeah, you go. That's more money for me. Why don't you just walk on out there? 
don't have time to do that. We think too much. And thinking is not faith. It's trusting. It's trusting. They had to leave things behind. Then it's something really interesting. It says that they took Jesus as he is. Notice what it says. Read there with me. It's an unusual way to word this. Leaving the crowd, verse 36, they took him with him in the boat just as he was. See that? Taking Jesus just as he is. And they almost use this like he is a piece of luggage. You know? They're going to just take him as he is. Well, there are two quick lessons here. Number one, you don't go anywhere without Jesus. Don't go anywhere without him. You take him with you. You can't just leave him home or leave him at church or leave him here while you're on vacation. You can't just leave him here when you go off and go live your life while you're at work. You can't check out of your faith and say, I'm, I know Jesus is part of my life, but you know what, Jesus, I want to leave this part of you. If, if you think of it you know, like you do this remote, this is I've got Jesus with me at all times, and I love Jesus, I trust Jesus, but you know what, I'm going to leave him here because I've got some things that I've got to do. You can't do that. You can't do that. You can't get into the boat and start going to the other side and saying, you know what, Jesus, I need to go back to get those things. If you'll just go on, I'll meet you later and I'll catch up. It's not about that. It's about taking Jesus as he actually is. And I, I put these things on here. All of these things. It's one of those uh, images I found that tell all the different aspects of Jesus and all the different things that, that, he's, that he has part of his life when the point I want you to see with this is you just can't take little pieces of Jesus. You just can't take the love of Jesus. You just can't take the, uh, the freedom that Jesus gives you. You just can't take little pieces of Jesus because it's convenient for you. you got to take Him as He really is. you got to take Him all. You can't just take pieces of what you like and what you don't like. Oh, I like this part about the Bible, but this part over here makes me feel uncomfortable, and I don't like You can't do that. You have to take Jesus at what He is, just as He is, whenever you carry Him. And sometimes that's convicting. Sometimes that requires more faith. Sometimes that requires you to lay aside more things. You see, I think that what we've done, I think that what we've done here is... We have lived our lives as Christians. And maybe we're not as passionate about our faith as we need to because we don't like certain parts of faith that we steer away from. We don't like feeling uncomfortable. We don't like pushing ourselves to the limit to things that are unknown. So we only take pieces. If we want to go to the other side, if we want to take the next step, we got to take him as he is. There was a song. You got to take the Lord with you wherever you go. You got to take the Lord with you. Come on now, wherever you go. You got to take the Lord with you. You got to take him. Come on, you got to take him wherever you go. In the street, in the home, in the crowds, all alone. You just got to take him wherever you go. You can't dress him up and make him look like something he's not. You got to take him as he is. The last thing we have to do is we have to stay focused. When they get into the boat, they go to the other side. And as they go to the other side, this great windstorm arises. The waves are breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling up. Small boat, remember? He was in the stern asleep on the cushion. Asleep. They woke him, rebuked the wind. I mean, they woke him up and they said, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? He awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was great calm. I want you to try to get an image of what this might look like and, and how this, this happens. It says when the storm hits, that great fear comes upon everybody. That everybody, these guys are afraid. 
And, and you wonder if, if they start bickering amongst one another and saying, what's he, how can he sleep? Does he not care what's going on in our life? I mean, our boat is filling up. We're going to perish here. And they take buckets and they start pouring it out as fast as they can as the boat continues to fill up. And every time they go out with one bucket, it's as if a, a, a cap of a wave comes in and fills it up even more. And he's resting. And it's as if they, you have to really shake him, wake him up. Jesus, Jesus, do you not care? Wake up! Where are you? When you take the next step, you're going to have storms, church. It's going to be uncomfortable. You're going to have setbacks and you're going to have problems. But what you have to do is you have to remain focused on why you went to the other side. Why you got in the boat to begin with. Why you decided to go. you got to stay focused on who's with you and not what's going on around you. And the disciples were so focused on this storm, they forgot they had the creator of the universe in the boat with them. And when we get when we lose our focus and we start focusing on all of our problems that we have in our life, when we lose that focus, we start doing the same thing. We start questioning things. We start coming up to Jesus and saying, don't you understand? Where are you? Don't you care about what's going on? Don't you care about what's happening to us? I'm drowning here, Jesus. I'm drowning in this debt. I'm drowning in this deceit. I'm drowning in this pain. Where are you? And you focus on all of the things you've got around you. And you forget to stay focused on who's with you. You take him wherever you go. And you take him as he is. The creator of the universe. And he can do amazing things. Now when Jesus rebukes the wind and peace be still... The wind ceased, there was a great calm. He said to them, why were you so afraid? Have you no faith? Have you no faith? Maybe today it's like this. When our finances get tight, we cut our offering to God because everything's tight and we have to pay our bills. And Jesus says, what's wrong with you? Do you not have faith? When life gets complicated, there's a whole lot of stuff going on in your life, and, and you quit coming to church because you got to take care of these things, Jesus might say, what's wrong with you? Where's your faith? When difficulties arise and we take time from God to resolve our problems, Jesus says, what's wrong with you? Have you no faith when we get disappointed and we give up on God and we quit and Jesus says to us, what's wrong with you? Where's your faith? Church, if we want to get on that boat and if we want to cross over to the other side, to the unknown, where we don't know where we're going and we don't know what he has in store for us and we know we're going to have to leave some comfort, we're going to have to leave our comfort zone and some things behind, but we've got to progress because we're trusting in this thing that when we get onto this side, there's going to be storms that come around us that, we, that shock us. The devil throws those temptations at us that kind of throw us off guard, but we can't give up and say, where are you? You wanted me to come, aren't you going to help me? You wanted me to come to this side. Aren't you going to give me some comfort? Where are you? You can't focus on those things. You got to keep your sights focused on who got you in the boat to begin with. And when you do that, all the whirlwind of things around you, they may not stop. I think this is very interesting that this word is used. The storms may not stop, but you know what you'll have? Peace. You see that? Peace. Because you know who you're focused on. Church, it is hard to move on, to cross over to the other side. It requires sacrifice. It requires time. It requires dedication. 
But no. If you had that option, if you were in that crowd that day when Jesus called those 12 disciples to him and talked to them individually, if you went home and you were not one of those 12, wouldn't you say something along the lines of, man, I wish you'd have called me. I wish you'd said my name. I wish I was the one that got to go with them. Well, here's the thing. He hasn't just called the disciples. He's called all of us. He's called us all to come. All of us to cross over with him. But it means you got to leave some things behind. you got to leave the crowd behind. you got to take him for as he really is, just as he is. You can't just take certain parts of faith in Jesus and get rid of the other things. You just can't take his love and peace and do away with his wrath and his anger. you got to have him all. you got to stay focused on why you went to begin with. So that you could see. When they left, when they got in that boat, you know what they talked about the rest of their lives when they got to the other side of the sea? They talked about the power that Christ had to cease the wind and the waves. The power that he had over nature. They got to talk about how powerful Jesus is and what he did for them. If you cross over, maybe not tomorrow, maybe not next week, but sometime in your life, you're going to be on the other side over here, and you're going to get to sit down with your grandchildren. You're going to get to sit down with a young man or young woman at church. You're going to get to sit down with a neighbor. You're going to get to sit down with somebody you work with, maybe another family member, and you're going to get to tell them just how powerful you got to see Jesus work in your life. But it takes a step. Now's the time for you to take that step if you need to. Maybe you've come only a certain point and you've put it off and you're ready to come a little further. Now's the time to take that step. That next step, don't think about it too long. You'll talk yourself out of it. Trust. Trust. And leave behind and then allow the power that Christ has work in your life. If you're not a member of the body of Christ, you can do that. You're not a Christian, here's your chance. If you got sin in your life, here it can be gone. You gotta trust. Step out. Take that step as we stand and sing the invitation song. You are the words and the music. You are the song that I sing. You are the melody, you are the harmony. Praise to your name I will bring. You are the Lord of Lords, you are the mighty God, you are the King of all kings. So now I give back to you the song that you gave to me, you are the song that I sing.